My name is Emily Thrush, and I'm the project coordinator at Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. I'll be moderating today's webinar, and our presentation today is going to use a hypothetical case scenarios to address ethical considerations in the context of the investigative function of prosecutors, digital evidence, discovery obligations, and immunity. It will identify confidential, privileged, non-material, and or irrelevant victim information in the record. We'll discuss threshold requirements for defense attempts to obtain information or for in-camera review. And we'll introduce pretrial and trial strategies that support the protection of victim privacy, including collaboration with allied professionals. Today's webinar is hosted by Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource on Violence Against Women, in collaboration with um, uh, NCVLI, which we will give a brief introduction to in a moment, but through funding from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office on Violence Against Women. And the written materials, as you saw before we started, is um, available for download now, and we can also send a, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, as well as our presenter's biographies after the presentation. We are recording today's webinar so that it can be viewed later and shared with colleagues. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Equitas's staff is comprised of former prosecutors with over 100 years of collective experience, and they conduct legal research, provide 24-7 case consultation, serve as mentors and instructors, and publish resources. Today's presenters are Jane Anderson, who is an attorney advisor here at, at Equitas, and Meg Garvin, the executive director and, and CBLI. As an attorney advisor with Equitas, Jane provides training, case consultation, and resources for prosecutors and allied professionals handling cases involving violence against women. And prior to joining Equitas, she served as an assistant attorney of uh, state attorney in Miami, Florida, where she was a founding member of the Human Trafficking Unit and the prosecutor in many of the state's first trafficking cases. Um, she spent her career handling domestic violence, sexual assault, um, homicide, and human trafficking cases, and was able to promote victim safety and provide the necessary support to help victims participate in the criminal justice system. Meg Garvin teaches victim law and litigates nationwide, in addition to her responsibilities as executive director at NCVLI. And we will be sending the full biographies after the webinar, as well as, like I said, the PDF of today's presentation. So I'd now like to turn it over to Meg, and she can introduce a little bit more about who um, this acronym that I've been saying, National Crime Victim Law Institute. Meg? Thanks so much. Uh, I just want to check, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so just briefly, who is the National Crime Victim Law Institute? Wanted to take just a moment here because the majority of the training is going to be about ethics for prosecutors. So kind of begs the question of why am I a victim's lawyer participating and how can um, I as an allied professional to you provide any assistance? Well, the National Crime Victim Law Institute works nationally with victim advocates and prosecutors as well as victim attorneys to identify ways to secure survivor participation in criminal justice in a way that doesn't result in re-victimization. So we are based at Lewis and Clark Law School, but we work all over the country providing resources um, to prosecutors, advocates, victims, attorneys on the legal rights of victims and how to leverage those during the criminal justice process to ensure privacy is protected, voice is heard, and that the system itself doesn't re-victimize and cause additional trauma symptoms. On our website, which is now up on your screen, you can find just myriad of resources that come through the lens of a victim's rights approach um, as well as a victim attorney approach. Uh, so hopefully you'll check out that website and then during the course of this training, I'm going to be chiming in from the perspective of if the hypothetical victim in the case was my client, what would you be seeing for me as the victim's lawyer during the process that can aid your uh, analysis of the ethics as you move forward as a prosecutor in the case? So I'm really excited to be here and just wanted to make sure you kind of knew the lens through which I would be speaking 
and who NCBLI is in the process. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Meg. And we really appreciate your perspective in this issue because I think what we're going to find out is that it really does take some collaboration when we talk about a lot of the issues that are going to come up today. Um, so first off, we're going to um, ask you to complete this poll, which is what, is what do you do? What's your profession? So I see a lot of prosecutors on the call along with the um, some systems-based advocates, attorneys working with victims, great. Good. Quite a diverse audience, which should be great for this. Um, and we are going to have some polls throughout the throughout the um, training today. So hopefully we can make it, you know, as interactive as a webinar possibly can be. <laughs> so um, we're going to start off with um, the objective. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see how do these ethical considerations come up, you know, um, throughout our our cases. So from beginning to end, and we want to make sure what we're doing is we're watching out for those types of issues that are going to implicate victims' privacy rights. Um, and then we're going to make sure that as prosecutors, we are doing our best to protect the victim's privacy within the bounds of our ethical obligations. We'll talk about how to do that from beginning to end and really then hopefully also introduce some strategies that you guys can take away from this. And while there are different considerations going on, most of these obligation, uh, objectives are going to be relevant to both the victim's attorneys on the call and prosecutors. And any of those of you that are working with, with victims of, um, of crime. Okay, so where do we get these ethical roles? The sources usually come from the model rules of professional responsibility. This included the link there if you want to see that. Um, but there are also some uh, ADA criminal justice standards, and those are specific standards that apply to prosecutors. And then we also have some state-specific rules, case law, and of course you should always be consider considering what your office policies are. So what privacy concerns do victims have? And we're asking you to use the chat box here to provide some answers. And these could be really broad because we know that um, every case is probably going to be a little bit different um, and different issues are going to come up depending on the facts of the case, who the victim is, who the offender is, if there are any witnesses, that kind of thing. So we have a few of you typing here, which is great. Um, information on the victim. OK, yeah, so confidentiality regarding addresses and contact information. Ooh, good one, medical information. I think that comes up a lot in cases um, involving either domestic violence where someone's had medical care or, in particular, sexual violence, right? Health care information, um, mental health information, trauma history. If we know that many of our victims are going to have compound trauma in their lives. Um, mental health treatment, social media messages, yes, picking up on the digital nature of some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, the routine release of counseling records. Hopefully we can maybe give you some strategies so that doesn't become, doesn't remain routine. Um, and the information that will make them vulnerable for future crimes. Yeah, or just the details of the crime itself, especially we've got here the sexual history. Uh, and the trauma history. OK, I think we marital counseling, social media, great. Cell phones, cell phones, <laughs> and release of family information, right? OK, so I think we've got some good ones there. And this is just uh, a slight uh, description of some things that might come up. And I think you guys picked up on most of them. And here we, of course, are looking for focusing on some digital things that come up. And Wi-Fi home devices, I'm sure many of you heard about some recent litigation about, um, I think it was like an Amazon Echo. Um, Fitbit information has been used in some cases recently. So it's just going to become more and more prevalent. This is um, a copyrighted image from the National Crime Victim Law Institute. I don't know if, Meg, you want to um, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, everything everyone identified in the chat box plus the prior slide, if you really pause to think about 
privacy. Um, this image captures the wonderful quote um, from the 2005 article that privacy for survivors is really like oxygen. It is something that for most survivors is all around them, and then as the justice system starts to operate, there's these moments of erosion of that privacy or kind of gobbling up of the oxygen around them. And uh, we really see it literally at every moment. So the one that wasn't specifically spoken about that I want to flag is education records, right? Many of us might think, you know, if you're the same age as me, which my photo makes me look a lot younger, um, <laughs> that, that, right, that education records, oh, that was my attendance record, right? Well, if you start to think about what's in records today, right, educational records have some testing information in it. They have information about maybe the school counselor because the school failed to segregate information. So really, all of this is, is um, at issue in cases, and from a victim's perspective, it's under attack in the cases. And so that's why this image about it being like oxygen um, is, I think, pretty palpable. And, and that's how we approach it. How do we make sure there's still oxygen in the space for the survivors that are going through the process? Great. Um, and this is just from a U.S. Supreme Court case. And it indicates that, yes, this criminal justice system is designed to protect the rights of defendants. Um, however, um, we have to give some justice to our accusers. So this is sort of a victim's rights acknowledgement back in 1934. Because what is this criminal justice system about if we are unable to provide accusers or victims with you know, this concept of fairness? So here are a couple of other way, uh, places where we derive our privacy rights. Um, and it um, indicates that it's the right to be left alone, it's a fundamental right, and there should be the safeguard for personal information. Privacy, it's not the trumpeting of the individual against society's interests, but the protection of the individual based on society's own norms and values. So this is sort of flipping it. Sometimes we um, we think that we're withholding something and that the victim not wanting to provide information is somehow um, somehow withholding something from the justice system. But in fact, we are protecting that individual's rights within society. Okay, so we have the federal constitution, the state constitution, federal and state statutory rules as well. So we get these sources of privacy rights from many different places. And it's beyond just privacy. We also have the right to protection, the right to access courts, to be treated fairly with dignity and respect, and the right to refuse discovery. So that's going to come up again um, while we go through our case history, this idea of victims being responsible for discovery. So let's start with our case file. We'll get into it. And this is a, a case that involves our victim named Sarah. And it begins with a 911 call. So a dispatch receives a call from a woman, clearly upset. She tells the dispatcher that her husband just choked her and threw her to the ground. She identifies herself as Sarah, and she says that she had run to a neighbor's house, and then she called 911 from the neighbor's house because her husband had grabbed the cell phone away from her. So the police arrive, and they find Sarah. She's at her friend Kristen's house. She directs the officer to her house next door and says she thinks her husband is still inside, and she alerts him that he has a rifle in the house. A second officer stays with Sarah and notes visible redness to her neck and the smell of alcohol on her breath. The, officer, uh, the other officer goes to Sarah's house, finds him in disarray. There's beer cans on the kitchen table. Uh, can't find the husband. He's not there, but he does find, the officer finds a young boy who's in his bedroom playing by himself. So the police call fire rescue. They treat Sarah on the scene, and then they end up transporting her to the hospital for further treatment. They take photographs of the injuries to Sarah and also some photographs of the scene at the house. Uh, Sarah's son, Boyd, is taken to her mother's house, and uh, he's staying the night with Sarah's mother. Sarah's husband, Michael, is arrested the next day because Sarah's friend, Kristen, called 911 saying that he'd returned to the house. At the time of his arrest, the police seized two cell phones from his pocket. 
And the police actually show them to Sarah. Sarah identifies one of the phones as her own phone, and the police return the phone directly to her at that time. OK. So you are the prosecutor assigned to this case, and you have reviewed the initial police report. So that information is all sort of contained in those reports. What privacy issues can you just anticipate based on that information alone? So what we want to do is we want to look at all the different types of things that should be popping up as red flags, right? So clearly the medical issues. We have both fire rescue that's treating her on the scene. They're going to have some medical reports, probably took some statements from her. And then the hospital records, of course. And um, when we sometimes get hospital records, you know, we want them for the evidence in the court. And you know, we're getting an entire medical history. So that's, I think, something that should be popping out. Now, also we have the privacy of our home, right? So here we have police officers that have come into the house. They've taken pictures. They've looked around. Maybe they're judging, um, you know, whether it's in disarray. You know, obviously we've got some beer cans, so we might have um, some alcohol uh, history um, that might be in our hospital records. Maybe some other kind of history there. But we also have the child being left alone. I think that should be popping out to us right away. Is that having the child in the house? What? Can we see the domino effect of what's going to maybe happen because of that? And can we see that for Sarah, that's probably going to be a very, very primary concern. Um, and then we have uh, the digital evidence, right? So all you guys already popped this out, the cell phone, right? We could also have, uh, imagine all the things that are now on our cell phones. It's not just you know our, our call records, but we've got social media that's on there. We could have banking records. We could have. Um, you know, contacts with a counselor or a friend. Um, and then, of course, the 911 call itself um, could contain information that um, we would, that the victim doesn't want others to have, definitely, you know, doesn't want it played on the nightly news, that kind of thing. So now I'm going to have uh, Meg kind of talk about the flip side, which is putting yourself in the shoes of being the victim's attorney. Yeah. So. Right, all the same privacy issues would pop for a victim's attorney, right? And so whether you were answering in the chat box as a prosecutor, a victim advocate, law enforcement, or a victim's attorney, the same issues would pop, right? So you start to be concerned about the same issues. So let's say you're, you are the victim's attorney and you're, you've reviewed all this information. Those concerns are swirling in your head. What do you need to know from your client? Like what's your starting point? Um, as you are going to meet with your client. What thoughts might you have on that? I'm just going to see if anyone chimes in. Um, oh, interesting. So questions about release to get medical records, what information is held. OK. One of the starting points I want to flag as the victim's attorney, um, yes, has there been a history of violence in the house? As the victim's attorney, one of the first things I need to do is actually figure out who my client is, right? And, and this is one that I think it's really important for all of us as allied professionals to think about. We have Boyd, right, and we have the mom. And they both may qualify as victims in this context and needing to know who is my client so that I can start the process. And that might seem semi-remedial, but in these family moments, particularly where privacy is at stake, knowing whose privacy or whose interests we are protecting as a victim's lawyer is really important. And can I, in fact, represent both of them, right? Or do I need to figure out, does Boyd need a guardian ad litem, right, in this context in order to protect his separate privacy? Because mom might not be thinking about the fact that on the 911 tape she named Boyd, right? And so she might think, oh, I have no interest in the privacy protections in 911 because I'm fine with it, right? Something along those lines. But in fact, Boyd may have very different interests in ensuring that his peers don't know, right? So my first step as a victim's rights lawyer and in figuring out privacy is who's my client? And then my second step as a victim's rights lawyer is really figuring out what the heck does my client want, right? Um, and that might seem counterintuitive to some of us, but I want to pause on that because 
all of us when it comes to privacy in particular, we bring um, a little bit of our own perception of the importance of privacy to the table. Um, and that can influence the way we think about it. So for me, personally, Meg Garvin, I am an incredibly <laughs> private person. Um, I very strategically share information um, with people. I do that, it's been my, my entire life I've been that way, whether it's with an intimate partner, with family, with friends, I really um, cabin various information. And I, when I first started to be a victim's lawyer, presumed that every victim I worked with absolutely cared about privacy in exactly the same way I did. And so a concrete example is working with a 14-year-old girl in California, and her diary was asked for through the subpoena process. And my immediate reaction was to try to stop that. Um, without pausing to speak with her and really find out what her interests were. And when I finally did through her local counsel there and we sat down and had a conversation, she was fine. She was fine with turning over her diary. Even, even after disclosure of the pros and cons and what might happen on cross-examination, all of it. The 14-year-old girl, totally fine turning over her diary. I had a visceral reaction of, oh, dear God, no, don't do it. Um, but she was fine with it including after talking to her therapist about it, all of it. She was fine. So my starting point is to have a conversation with my clients about their privacy interests, the why, the how, and then my job is to fight for it the way they want to, not the way I presume, and to be honest, not the way that it either helps or hurts the case. My job is just to talk to my client about their privacy and then do for them what they want done. Um, so those are the two starting points from a victim's lawyer standpoint. Who is my client? And then what do they want out of privacy? Um, and then I go forth. Right. Okay, so we're going to get back into our case. So we've had some further investigation. The detective assigned to the case lets you know, the prosecutor know the following. Basically, the detective tells you, hey, I know Sarah and Michael. There have been previously, previous cases between them. Uh, also, boy, he got Michael, that's from a Sarah's previous relationship, and that one was also abusive. And uh, Michael, he's kind of an internet star, he's an amateur UFC fighter, and he's got uh, quite an internet uh, following on Facebook where he posts training videos, amongst other things. So we've got this further information from our detective. So the question is, can you, as a prosecutor, can the prosecutor share this information with the victim's attorney. So it's the yes or no question, can the prosecutor share it with the victim's attorney? Okay. The votes are coming in. Interesting. Interesting. Most of them, um, most of you guys are saying that, uh, yes, you can share this information with the victim's attorney. A couple of you guys saying no. I think there are probably various considerations about should you and under what circumstances, but um, I will let you know that the ethical answer is that there is no ethical rule preventing, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, there's no ethical rule that prevents the prosecutor from sharing this information with the victim's attorney. Um, Can yeah. I jump in on that point? Sorry for the interruption. One of the considerations, and um, so coming from the victim's attorney's perspective, there's no ethical prohibition. One of the considerations is how do you share it with us? The way I'm going to want it shared, just so you know, so the request you might get from me is, um, you know, I'd love to sit down and talk with you about things, right? That's definitely one of the ways I want to get information. But also if anything is actually documented, um, i.e. In, in your report, I'm going to want that too. So you may end up having two questions about disclosure to the victim's attorney. That is, can you just tell them? And then if it's documented, can you share documentation? And um, again, the ethical boundaries around those are probably the same. There's no bar. But the other statutory and rule-based obligations may be different in them. So I just want to flag that because I, as a victim's attorney, I'm going to want it both ways. Um, so just be kind of prepared for that inquiry. Great. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so the detective learns that the defendant's boxing name is Machine Mike. So the detective shares that with you. Can you, and we'll, we'll ask this from different perspectives, but 
let's see from the prosecutor's perspective. Can you Google the defendant's name and nickname? Okay, can you do that? We all love that. So it's not ethically impermissible to conduct these online searches. Obviously, it's public information. You're allowed to do it. Um, the only thing I would sort of flag as a prosecutor is that online search may be considered investigation. Um, and when prosecutors start getting involved in investigation, um, it does implicate immunity. So as a prosecutor, you have absolute immunity um, in all your functions that you do that are intimately associated with the judicial phase of the criminal process. So your work as a prosecutor, you've got absolute immunity. It's a lovely place to be um, and to be covered by it. So this includes things like initiating the prosecution, presenting the case, drafting legal documents, and presenting in court. Those are sort of you know, the typical prosecutor things. So this does not include acting as your own investigator, giving legal advice to police, attesting to the truth of facts, and signing a search warrant affidavit. So I think a lot of you prosecutors are probably used to this. And it usually comes up in the form of you know, the officer, or police officer calls you and says, hey, should I make this arrest? And you're like, I can't tell you whether to make this arrest blah, 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 and you sort of um, walk through, through that process with the police officer, and ultimately it's the officer's decision to make. So acting as your own investigator uh, puts us in a different place. And what it says is that if you're doing the same stuff that a police officer is doing, which in this case like an investigation, investigating, um, then you're going to be you're going to have the same immunity as a police officer has, and that's qualified immunity. Basically, when the functions of the prosecutors and the detectives are the same, the immunity is the same. So you could be putting yourself by conducting a sort of online search that could be considered investigation. You could be putting yourself out from under absolute immunity and now under qualified immunity. Not too scary. Uh, qualified immunity is still really great, and it basically says that um, we, those that are performing discretionary functions were shielded from liability for civil damages insofar as our conduct does not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. So we really have to go quite far afield of constant, someone's constitutional rights to have that qualified immunity not also cover us. So we should be OK there. So now we find uh, we find machine machine Mike on Facebook, also on Instagram. So a couple of questions here I want you guys to think through, which is, can you friend him on Facebook? Um, can you follow his Instagram account? And is this is your answer going to be different if you're a prosecutor versus a victim's attorney? So I've got somebody saying prosecutor no. You can't be friending them. You can't be following them. Um, and no friend, don't follow. Duh. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so these are the questions to ask. Shockingly, there's not a lot out there right now as far as ethical uh, case law goes. But I think that duh, no is probably um, a good place to start. You know, it's sending a friend request communication. That's obviously a problem if it is, because we have our defendant um, who is represented. Um, now, can we articulate a difference between sending a friend request and following a publicly accessible social media account? Probably. I think you probably aren't going to get in as much trouble if you're just following an account. Um, it seems to be sort of a less proactive stance, right? So. What is that ethical obligation that's implicated? We're really talking about uh, it just doesn't smell good. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't smell right. Um, but it would be perhaps perceived as a communication with a represented person. Now, is this going to be any different for our victim's attorney? What do we think, Meg? So uh, someone in the chat box actually pointed this out already, right? With regard to the represented person, um, if it is a communication with them, then mm -hmm. we're, we're governed by the same ethical moment, right? If we can um, categorize it as not a communication, so the following of a public moment, then probably it's fine. 
That said, I want to flag some additional things that go through a victim's attorney's mind on this, right? Um, one, while I too should not be made a witness in a case, I will tell you that victims' attorneys often are being subject to inquiries about whether they can be um, a witness in a case, right? And the case law on this is not as clear as it is for prosecutors about when you are and aren't. So the law around victims' attorneys being made a witness to a case is just fuzzier, so we always have to think about it a little bit more. And then I also have ethical obligations to my client so information I learn if I follow something publicly, so if I go down the non-communication path, I have to really think through when do I share that with my client, um, right? Because I am, I am their actor, right? And so I have to think about why am I? I'm not an investigator, right? I, my job is not to prove a case. It's just for the victim's rights. So I would really need to pause to think about why on earth would I be doing this <laughs> following um, in the first instance, and then what are my obligations to disclose it to my client, and does my client want me to be disclosing that, right? And then my clients, I will tell you, often ask me, well, why don't I just follow them, right? And, um, and right, I can, they <laughs> often want that contact, and I am like, whoa, Right, let's talk about the ramifications of if you continue um, a social media friendship with a perpetrator. What does that present as later, right? Um, if you have protective orders, no contacts, what are the ramifications? So while the ethics are relatively similar or are identical with regard to the contact with a represented person, I have some ethical obligations to my client that are implicated in this moment also that I'll have to go through. That's great. Um, okay, so now we are meeting with the victim, and Sarah tells us that Mike has been abusive for most of their three-year relationship. She also tells you that two days before this incident, he forced her to have sex. And uh, we, we are recognizing more and more how often that does occur in our domestic violence situations, that we also are seeing this intimate partner sexual assault. So. Um, not surprising. And then she also tells us that um, Boyd walks in on the rape um, after hearing after hearing Sarah cry out. So I've got some more information. Sarah tells us she doesn't want to do anything about the rape. She doesn't want to have that investigated or charged. And she begs you, please don't you know don't tell anyone else about this. So you're if you're the prosecutor. Do you have an ethical obligation to tell the detective about this disclosure? Um, and then we'll move on to the victim's attorney side. So if you're the victim's attorney, do you have an ethical obligation to tell the detective or the prosecutor about the disclosure? And are you ethically able to actually disclose this information to anyone? So two different questions there. As a prosecutor, what would that, um, I think we actually have a poll, sorry. Um, if you are the prosecutor, do you have an obligation to tell anyone this information? So yes or no, and then um, if you want to also tell us who you have an obligation to tell, if the answer is yes. So prosecutor, yes, you need to tell the detective. Also, uh, no ethical obligation to disclose. Okay, so. We're getting mostly yes. There's quite a bit of no's as well, actually, not too open. So yes, tell the lawyer and the detective. OK, Jackie's pointing out that DCF or CPT, which I'm guessing is Child Protective Services or Department of Children and Families. Yeah, so that's really what I think is most implicated here in this information is, do you have an obligation? Um, I think there isn't an ethical obligation that I know of, and I could be wrong, I'm guessing um, that you have to tell your detective this. I think most of us would, and we would probably have that conversation with Sarah and let her know that you know that, that you would be sharing this with the detective on the case. Um, but I don't know of any ethical obligation that you're under to do that, and there, but there could be some maybe state-specific rules or office policy rules and things like that that are implicated. But the answer is with the, um, as far as the CPS, you are a mandated reporter. I think in almost any situation, that would be an obligation of yours is to share that information with Child Protective Services. And that's going to be something that could really put a, a chilling effect on your relationship with the victim. So it bodes well 
um, we'll talk about some strategies, but to have these conversations up front because you really don't want to be placing the victim in, in a, you don't want to be in a situation where you're having to act in such a way that your victim's probably going to, you know, perhaps not be um, cooperative after that information. So the victim's attorney, obviously, is different than the prosecutor. Um, so Meg, I don't know if you want to chime in here about um, sort of that perspective as the victim's attorney, both in yeah. sharing the information and the mandatory reporting. Yeah, so it is, it is different in that if I learned, if it was me meeting with my client and I learned of the information during the attorney, in an attorney-client privileged communication, right, I may be forbidden, right, because of my ethical obligations to my client to disclose certain information. That said, um, some, some states' ethical rules on mandatory reporting, there's very fine lines with regard to child endangerment, right? So there's an analysis here because we know that um, uh, the son came in, right? Boyd came in on the rape after hearing his mother cry out. So I have to figure out, is there a child endangerment moment at all that mandates reporting, even if it was during an attorney-client privileged moment? And then I have to analyze, was it during an attorney-client privileged information inf uh, moment that I learned it? So my analysis initially seems easier in some ways, but in fact it's actually more complicated or differently complicated because I have to figure out what type of communication was it, am I a mandatory reporter in that moment, and then how do I communicate with my client about the disclosure. And so the exact same things you pointed out about I should have really had some of these conversations with my client in advance. Um, govern a victim's attorney as well. Um, so uh, just different ethical analyses, both complicated, but complicated by different things. So, so I think what we have here is sort of this idea that, first off, we have responsibility to understand what privileges, what confidentiality is, um, how it's implicated in our separate roles, and then as a prosecutor, it's imperative that we explain that to them. It doesn't need to be like a super complex legalese conversation, but I'm sure everyone on this call has been in a situation where a victim thinks that the prosecutor is their attorney. Um, you know, that's even on, on TV it seems like that. You know, that's just sort of the common lay person's um, easily, mis mis easily misunderstanding. So have that conversation and try to do it in a way that really communicates what you're trying to communicate, which is that the limits of your confidentiality and things that you're being told you're going to have to disclose. And in fact, that information, if in any way it was material to your case or exculpatory, I mean, you know, that's not only just I've got to tell the detective as a heads up, but I may have to disclose it to the defense. And then we also want to make sure that we are, are, we are explaining the difference between a systems-based and a community-based advocate, right? Many of us have you know, they're called different things, but a victim advocate or a victim witness counselor that is working for the prosecutor's office, and their job is to sort of provide these services and get victims in touch with, you know, perhaps outside services, restitution, keep them abreast of what's happening with the case. That person doesn't have a confidential relationship with the victim, but the victim may believe that that is a that that's like a a counselor, and then of course that's why we always encourage. Um, connecting victims with community-based advocates because those are the only ones that really have that strict confidentiality. Sometimes frustrating, but such a need for our victims to have that confidential relationship with someone. And it's not, unfortunately, the prosecutor or a systems-based advocate. So I think it goes without saying that, uh, Meg, in your role as a victim's attorney, you want to be having those conversations as well and not just explaining the advocate things, but also, you know, explaining the prosecutor's role. Yes, absolutely. I will say that is a conversation um, that takes many, many iterations um, because, <laughs> because victims really do um, first come and say, the prosecutor is my attorney. And there's a lot of, which is wonderful. It means they're feeling supported, right? But when we get to these moments of shared information, it, it really takes some unpacking um, to, A, continue to nurture that close relationship with the prosecutor um, and a prosecution-based victim advocate, but then to really explain to them that they have some level of choice 
right? What are the obligations um, and duties of the different people involved in the system? So we, like you, have this conversation probably um, very frequently with survivors about what are the roles and what are the duties of each role uh, and really trying to ensure that what we're doing for survivors is letting them choose how to communicate with each of us rather than communicating and then losing privacy because they didn't understand the distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now it comes to the key part here we were all waiting for, the victim's cell phone. So at this point, what, how it's implicated is that the victim actually comes to you and says, hey, I've been getting these text messages. Michael's been reaching out. Uh, she shows them to you on your cell phone, and these texts are clearly in violation of a protective order that the court has installed. So the detective, you tell the detective, detective wants to download your victim's cell phone, right? Download it, forensically examine it. They want the contents of the cell phone so that you can go forward at maybe a, a, a violation of pretrial release conditions or a contempt of court. So what privacy concerns will the victim have? I mean, I think that goes without saying. Our lives are on those cell phones. <laughs> um, and you know that downloading that cell phone is going to implicate so much there. So I wanted to point out that, I'm sure all prosecutors on the table, know this Wiley v. California it came out in 2014, so fairly recently, but basically the court in this case recognized that there are several interrelated privacy consequences when we're talking about, um, in this case, it was a, obviously a defendant's cell phone, but they recognized in the same language as is key for perhaps you making an, an argument on the other side that there's just all this massive amounts of storage, this interconnectivity of data. So um, one piece of information might not seem all that relevant, but that information with all the other data that's on the phone um, can really sort of paint a picture of, a, of somebody's life. And then the information, of course, goes back years and years and years. This case says, you know, more than 90% of adult Americans own cell phones on their person, and it's nearly, it's a digital record of nearly every aspect of their lives. So this is a great case. Obviously, it's, it's talking about um, whether an officer can just go into a defendant's cell phone, but, you know, those arguments of what's good for the goose is good for the gander sometimes can be, can be strong. So when we're looking, how do we explain to a court why, um, you know, we can't just order a victim to have her, um, the cell phone downloaded, um, this can come in handy. So um, collecting this evidence, we do want a record of the cell phone evidence, right, these text messages. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. There's that full-blown forensic examination done by law enforcement, right? Um, but you can also privately retain an expert, and this is something that a victim's attorney would likely be involved in. And what the advantage of that is, um, is that the expert would forensically examine the phone, and then the victim's attorney could redact it and provide law enforcement with only a portion of it. Law enforcement prosecutors, this is not going to be our favorite way to get the information, <laughs> and that privately retained expert is going to have to make himself or herself available to testify if we're ever getting to the point of energy fitness and evidence, because there's some, you know, there's some, death, there's some challenges there. Um, but we can also record this evidence on the phone through a screenshot. Um, so our victim can just screenshot the phone and then maybe email it to us or the detective. We can also just photograph the phone um, and we can video record it. Um, in my experience, juries really like the video recording because you can actually record, you know, Sarah or the detective flipping through those, um, those uh, text messages. And I think it just sort of uh, has a little bit more um, um, foundational requirements, right? So there's less argument that you are mocking up a photograph or a video than a photograph, you know, because you're seeing, they're seeing almost you live going through it. So that's one way to do it. And that's, I think, uh, in this case where really all we need is a couple of text messages, that's a perfectly acceptable way to do it. You can also download it, email it to yourself, sort of pull it from the cloud service or maybe transfer it to an electronic service storage device. Frankly, thinking down the line of trying to get this into evidence, not my favorite either, um, just because you're having to explain a, like a secondary digital um, storage mechanism. And it can just, judges are not comfortable with this type of evidence. Defense attorneys are really easily putting up red herrings, trying to say that this isn't admissible. 
But if you've got a screenshot, a photo, or um, a video, all you have to do is enter it in as an evidence as a photograph, excuse me. So that's the foundational questions are, is this a photo of, you know, does it fairly and accurately represent your phone when you receive this text message? Yes. Um, and then you can, the defense can argue weight, but not the admissibility. The admissibility is pretty low bar there. And if you have any additional questions, there's another webinar that we recorded called Hashtag Guilty, my favorite title that we have in our webinar library thanks to my former colleague, the Chief of Cybercrimes in Miami-Dade County, he came up with that for me. Um, OK, so discovery. The prosecution's filing a discovery notice. And what we're doing is we're providing screenshots of this text message um, and uh, from the victim's phone. And we've also got a downloaded video um, from Machine Mike's public Facebook account saying, um, this is how you deal with a bitch. And he's like punching a punching bag. So we find that relevant. We turn that over as well. In response to this prosecution discovery filing, of course the defense now files a motion to compel, hey, I want the victim's cell phone. Are you obligated to provide the defense access to the victim's cell phone? No. <laughs> so what's, what is your best argument? So the options are a victim's cell phone is private and cannot be ordered provided to defense. Um, the police gave the phone back to the victim, or you don't have a good argument, the defense has a right to this phone, you're getting it turned over. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to, to do that. Okay. So most of you are saying the victim's cell phone is private and cannot be ordered to provide the phone. Okay. Um, and this is kind of a tricky one, because I think that is true. But I think your best argument actually is, hey, I don't have the phone. So please give it back to the victim, right? We can't um, be required to provide something that's not in our care, custody, and control. And of course, that is implicated for you know, if a police officer has it. But if it's in the victim's control, then um, we don't have it. But never stop to judge from saying, hey, order your victim to bring to bring the phone in. So I think that's your secondary argument is, hey, you know, I think um, there's no right to discovery from a victim and that we've got all these privacy implications. So um, good job with that. I, I want to flag, and I will make Please. sure that um, I neglected to include this citation, but there's a wonderful quote if you do start getting into this battle over can you be compelled as a prosecutor to go get the phone since you don't have possession. There's a lovely quote out of a federal court, um, and I'll get the citation to the host so it can go back out um, unless someone knows off the top of their head, but it says, a prosecutor is not a valet of the defendant. Um, so the idea that you have to go find it and bring it to the defendant, and it was in the context of do you have to go get something from the victim and bring it to him. Um, but that said, we are seeing this litigated over and over again around mm -hmm. the country is um, can you be compelled to go get it from the victim or can you be compelled um, to get the victim into court so the jurisdictional issue over the victim, him or herself, is a pretty ripe issue, um, but I agree with your analysis. It's, it's number two is the strong argument in terms of I don't have it, right? I can't give what I don't have. Um, and starting with that is a really important um, place. OK, and, um, for those of you looking at the chat, it looks like one of our participants has just shared um, some great cases out of California. So feel free to, to look that up, too. So um, you know, obviously, I'm, the prosecutor's worried, hey, the screenshot's not going to be good enough evidence in court. It's going to be attacked by the defense. Of course it will. And so I'm saying, hey, pretty please, victim, can you give me the phone? I want to get it downloaded, have it examined, because I think that's going to be stronger evidence in court for my case, right? So that's my position as the prosecutor, obviously. I want to have the strongest evidence possible, and maybe I'm a little bit worried about how the judge is going to rule on the screenshot, or I think the defense is going to be able to get the jury convinced that this isn't reliable. So as the victim's attorney, what can you do? What are you, what's your position at this point? Yes, yeah, so, so I, 
Yeah, right. and so in, fill in in the chat box what you think. My, my point on this one is, again, go right back to the starting point of this whole conversation. I talk with my client, right? So if, as a victim's attorney and someone in the chat box said, um, go right to talk to your clients as well. Yep, that's my starting point. And I, without um, kind of a, um, anything in this race myself, right, um, uh, I would just sit with my client and I would say, okay, we've heard from the prosecutor about why he or she thinks this would be better evidence. Here's what the impact of better evidence has on a case, right? It probably moves forward better to secure prosecution. It might stand up better on appeal. Those are, the, those are the pros if you're interested in securing a prosecution. Here are the cons, right? They might get more information off your cell phone, right? I just sit with them and I give them the pros and cons of all of it, and then they have the choice, right? They have just myriad of rights. They have um, uh, the rights that are based in state constitution, um, sometimes the right to refuse discovery, the right to safety, the right to privacy. All of those rights are probably at play in this conversation. And what's not on the screen is also, right, we often think of Fourth Amendment as only attaching to a defendant, right, but it attaches to everyone um, in our community, right? So a victim also, right, has the right against um, Fourth Amendment searches, right? They have to be reasonable searches. So I have all of these rights that I could deploy for the victim if he or she wants to say no. No, I'm not going to turn that over, and then I will be into um, a battle over if a subpoena issues, what do I do? If a court tries to compel, what do I do? Um, but really, the starting point is talking to the victim. If the victim opposes it, then I go to where do my rights attach, because that's what gives me standing to separately argue, because, of course, the victim's rights are not contingent on what the prosecutor wants to do with them. I get to exercise them for the, for the victim. Mm -hmm. Great. So the detective actually in this case, she gets consent from Sarah to have the phone forensically examined. It was downloaded, and now we've got this report that has everything in the world, including text, photos, contact appointments, website activity. So it's really large. Uh, it's given to you on a thumb drive. As a prosecutor, can you review the entire report, and do you need to turn over that thumb drive to defense? I'm going to go a little quickly here, um, and I think these are the considerations that you need to make. You know. Can you limit the scope of a victim's consent? So in this case, we just say we got consent. But let's think about it. If we have our victim sign maybe a narrowly tailored consent form that I'm only allowed to, um, to search for, I'm only allowed you know, to get text messages and maybe a date range or something like that, is it possible? Now, depending on your forensic software, you may not really be able to limit what is downloaded. But um, most search warrants are going to require sort of this two-part um, search, and that's the search of the entire phone and then the search within that download for the information that's key. So can you do the same thing with a victim's phone? Is there, you know, this concept of a taint team is, um, is sort of the same concept on a very smaller level. Um, so can you offer to have the victim retain independent forensic count, uh, company? If that's something the victim has the access has the um, means to do, maybe that's a way to, to get your information limited in scope like that. But eventually what's really probably the most realistic here is that we've got this huge report. We're going to redact it. We're going to make sure we're only turning over things that are relevant, material, and maybe some exculpatory information, not maybe, and exculpatory information. And then what we do is we tell the defense what we did. Hey, we redacted this. We're only giving you X, Y, and Z. That gives them the knowledge to then go to the court and ask for something else. And, um, and then there you can make your arguments over um, your discovery obligations that you've met them. And then realistically, the judge will probably say, hey, I'll review the whole content and then I'll make the determination whether you've, um, you've uh, met all of your discovery requirements. You shouldn't automatically let your judge do that. Um, you know, the privacy of your victim, you know, that extends to the judge. Um, so you want to be fighting over that, but um, I think that's where we land most of the time, to be honest. So you've got this full review of the forensic examination. We've got these photographs, victims posing very provocatively, kind of in a whip in a uh, S&M costume. We've got some video um, of the defendant walking in and out of buildings. It seems like our victim maybe recorded the defendant surreptitiously. And then we've got some flirty text messages between the victim and a coworker. 
So we talked to the victim about what we found on the phone, saying, hey, I think this stuff might be something that we need to turn over because it's going to be construed as relevant material or exculpatory, right? So we need to make sure we're doing the right analysis. So she's saying, hey, these photos were for Michael. I sent them to him as, you know, kind of a gift. The videos were taken over a year ago when um, she thought he was having an affair. And this was a flirtation with a coworker, but it never went any further than that. So what, if anything, do we need to turn over to the defense? Um, so we've got everything, only the photos, only the videos, only the flirtation, and then a combination of those, and then nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've got nothing and everything. Everything. That's the only most we have so far. <laughs> Fantastic split down there. <laughs> and we've got uh, some people saying just the photos and the videos and maybe not the flirtation. So it's going to be fact, fact specific here, right? You always kind of have to see things through the lens of the defense attorney. What's the defense attorney going to think is exculpatory and kind of walk through all those possible permutations? and other, other considerations that you want to be looking at as far as, um, you know, how long ago this happened. So that those videos of her recording Michael were over a year ago. Does that mean that it's no longer really relevant? And so these are some of the arguments you're going to be making as you go through that. It's, um, you know, the constitutional right, the state law and common law, lack of relevance, no probative value, no bearing on credibility or any other material issue. Um, that these are unduly inflammatory and basically there's this danger of harm and prejudice and it outweighs any probative value. Um, you know, if you've had that conversation and you really feel like, hey, this, I could see the defense arguing uh, she's making this all up because she caught him having an affair and she's mad. Like that's, you know, as a defense attorney, that's going to be one of your, uh, your tactics. So you don't ever want to be in a position where you're charged with having not turned over something that was exculpatory. In California, I think it's now a felony if you do that. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm uh, exaggerating. But then what do we do with it? It's like turn it over and then we can litigate it, right? So even if um, victims and prosecutors agree on the argument, your victim's attorney might consider filing separate um, motions here um, to preserve any appellate intervention. Um, remember, because the prosecutor is not the victim's attorney. And so standing kind of comes up here. Um, but also think about if we do have to turn it over, what can we do? Can we have the court issue protective orders to limit further dissemination? Can we also talk uh, limiting instructions for the jury? Perhaps we can do motions in limine for some of these things, not going further beyond you know, just that discovery right. So going forward, we're just asking you guys to be proactive in how you protect victims' privacy while also being ethical. I think so many of us working as prosecutors, you know, we're sort of work under this open file system where it's just like, here, come and see everything. And most of the time that's a great way to approach our cases. We never get in trouble for that as far as our ethical obligations go. But in cases where we have these real private issues that we're dealing with with victims, I think we can do a better job um, sort of sticking up for their rights. Um, now, not having that, you know, not doing that for the sake of our ethical obligations, but really, you know, not turning over that cell phone, not turning over that entire social media account without really looking at it. What are my discovery obligations? And is it easier for me just to turn over that thumb drive? Probably. But what am I doing on behalf of my victim if that's my policy there? So. Respond effectively to those motions. And I'm sure, Meg, you'll jump in that you know your organization will help um, yep. if these issues start popping up. I know you already provided some great resources. Um, and then just have that understanding. And I encourage any of you that are working on cases where there are victims, where your victims are represented, to really start working with the attorneys. And I think you'll have a better understanding of where your victim's coming from and what might be frustrating at some point, I think in the long run it can be a really fruitful relationship. So thank you guys for everyone being here. Thank you, Meg, so much. I don't know if you've got some cl some closing comments. We've got 30 seconds. <laughs> My only closing is this webinar itself is kind of 
um, emblematic of a great approach, which is let's all understand each other's roles and then let's partner because the best thing for our communities is survivors who feel supported because they'll they'll hang in there with the system or they'll report mm -hmm. crime. And the best way to support survivors is to protect their privacy and open up choice. So this collaborative approach is really the way to make criminal justice work. And that's a great way to end it. I thank you so much, Meg, for helping out today and for all the great information you were able to share. And um, we're both available for any questions, but our time is up here. So thank you all for the work that you do. And uh, know that you've got resources out here. We're willing to help you with, your, with all the hard work you guys are doing day in and day out. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Meg. And um, as you can see, we have the materials available. You can download the slides so that you can refer back to them. I will be sending out an email that also has that handout um, and the handouts that Meg avail uh, made available from NCVLI. And yeah, thank you again for your attendance and your participation. Um, and just know that both of our organizations, both Equitas and National Crime Victim Law Institute, are here and available uh, for your needs. And please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.